from Tibet, Ladakh, Puri, Kashmir, all saying Jesus was here, and some of them saying Jesus was here when he was older. Do we dismiss those Indian accounts of history simply because they're Indian accounts? To talk about the possibility of Jesus having been in India, what we are doing is comparing narrative traditions. It isn't that there's physical evidence for the Orthodox Jerusalem Roman story and no physical evidence for any of the others. There's no physical evidence of any of the global narratives concerning Jesus. You might be shown ancient sites in the Levant and be told, oh, well, this is where Jesus was born, or this is the hill where he was crucified, or this is the house in which he lived in Capernaum. You'll be shown physical sites, but it's a narrative tradition that relates those sites to moments in the story of Jesus. Similar with the claim at Rosa Ball. It is a catacomb, and there is a carving that makes a claim that it's the catacomb of Jesus, that it's this particular Jesus, this particular Isa or Yus Asaf, who's buried here. It's a narrative claim, even with something like the Shroud of Turin, which is a fascinating artifact. Officially, the jury's out. It hasn't been accurately dated, but even if it's dated to the first century of the Common Era, and there's a case for that, how do you then say, well, that is the shroud that belonged to Jesus? That is just a narrative tradition. You can't physically prove that. And so it's a matter then of weighing the claims, weighing the narratives against each other. When I talk to Indian Christians, some are very quick to say, oh yes, we know that Jesus was here because it's always been told in this region, narrative tradition. And others will say, oh no, 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 it's Thomas who came. We know Thomas came here in 52 of the Common Era. That's the beginning of the Thomist church, the Martoma church. And if you ask, well, how, did you, how do you know that? Well, it's always been known. It's been told from one generation to the next. It's the narrative tradition here. That's fine. But there's also a narrative tradition at Hemis, and it may even be a documentary tradition. Once again, we might be able to get to the document at some point at Hemis Monastery and date it. But if we were to date that close to the time of Jesus and elements of the story relate, it's still a narrative tradition. It's circumstantial evidence for sure, but it's not proof. It's a matter of weighing the credibility of one narrative tradition against the other. I think we make the assumption that because it became orthodoxy, that was the view with all the evidence behind it. And yet you go back to as near to the time of Jesus as possible, and you find not a single story of historicity, but a kaleidoscope of stories and views of Jesus and his life before, during, and after the cross. One of those narrative traditions became orthodoxy, and in the fourth century of the Common Era, the Emperor Theodosius, illegalized all other views. And that's why all the other Christian stories of Jesus were lost, destroyed, burned, or buried in the desert for their protection so that future generations might have a bigger range of stories to sit with and consider what Jesus was really about. In the absence of physical proof, and in a world of narrative traditions, do we even know that Jesus existed? One of the challenges is that when you go back to the time of Jesus, there is nothing in the documentary record that attests to his existence. All the evidence we have of the existence of Jesus is one degree removed. The documents we have are about what the first Christians 
believed. And so I remember studying this at school when we studied the letters of Pliny to the Emperor Trajan, asking how to deal with the early Christians. And he talks about what it was they believed. And then we have the early church fathers of the patristic period who give us a pretty clear idea of what the first Christians believed about Jesus. But we don't have any documentation from the time of Jesus himself. There's no record of a crucifixion of a person called Jesus. There is no record of a conflict between Pontius Pilate and Jesus. It's only in the Gospels that we have that information. And then one degree removed when we hear Josephus and Tacitus and Suetonius talking about the Christian story and what the Christians believed. So that's not quite getting to the root of it. The reason I believe there was an historical Jesus who really did tour with a ministry of teaching and healing is that it's quite easy to track how his story was distorted. We go to Eusebius and we realize that when Eusebius tells the story of the conversion of the Emperor Constantine, he's actually doing two things. And he did it on the request of the Emperor Constantine to report the story of a particular battle in a way that would endorse him as a Christian emperor and Jesus as a supporter of the empire. When Eusebius tells the story of Constantine winning the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, fighting under the banner of the cross, what he's saying is that Jesus endorsed that battle and Constantine's winning of the battle. It's told as the story of Constantine becoming a Christian, but it's really a story showing that Jesus is now supporting imperial conquests, endorsing Constantine as the emperor. So in effect, Jesus has now become a Roman citizen and a supporter of the Imperium. What happens in that documentary sense also happens in Roman art depicting Jesus, in which Jesus is portrayed in Roman military uniform. So now he's under the emperor, fighting for the emperor and for the empire. And so when you realize that the story of Jesus has been deliberately distorted to become something that the empire can work with, you realize that in the beginning it was something else, that they had had to subvert something that was already in existence and already quite powerful. And for me, that distortion is the strongest evidence of a real authentic Jesus that somebody did come and teach and have such an impact as to create a new movement which the Roman Empire realized it would need to hijack and turn into the Imperial Department of Religion. And so for me that is evidence that the original Jesus was actually rather inconvenient to the forces of empire. And as I said before, you read slowly enough what Jesus has to say about feudalism, about the money system, about the tax system. And you'll realize that the original Jesus was no friend of the forces of empire. That's why his story had to be distorted. So I believe there was an historical Jesus whose story then needed to be told. In the beginning, Jesus' story was told in a myriad of ways. The Gospel of Thomas and the theoretical source of Q give testimony to the earliest Christian tradition. Gnostic, pre-canonical and canonical texts all attest to the kaleidoscope of early views surrounding Jesus. In the canonical Gospels, we have a telling of the Jesus story which is full of tropes from the ancient world. And I think until we understand that tropes are being used, we miss a big part of the messaging. So, for instance, if we look at the story of the empty tomb at the end of the original version of the Gospel of Mark, what does that mean? To our mind, 
it looks like a, a funny, rather foreshortened end to the gospel. Why end with an empty tomb? Well, the answer is because if you set the Gospel of Mark in the context of Roman literature, Egyptian literature, Greek literature, you'll realize that a missing body is really a claim to divinity. So when Jesus has died and then the body goes missing, this is really the writer's way of saying he is no longer here. He has ascended. He is now among the gods. It is a divinity claim. And in fact, by ending with an empty tomb, Mark is simply finishing the way he told us he would finish right at the beginning of the gospel. In chapter 1, verse 1, he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God. And that Son of God, that divinity claim, is there right at the end with the finding of the empty tomb. It's one of a number of tropes that you can find in the Gospels that are really divinity claims. So the feeding of crowds of people miraculously, walking on water miraculously, manipulating weather miraculously, being born of a virgin miraculously. These were all well-established tropes in Egyptian literature, in Roman and Greek mythology, so that anyone reading the Gospels in that context knows straight away, oh, I can see what this is all about. They're claiming that Jesus was divine. But of course, mainstream Christianity through the ages, post-Emperor Theodosius, has encouraged Christian believers to read the Bible in isolation and not see it within the family of literature to which it really belongs. Is it possible that the tropes surrounding the story of Jesus are in fact historical? Simply because these tropes were used in the past concerning mythological figures, is it impossible that the historic Jesus actually did these things? Many Orthodox believers today believe that to defend Jesus, they have to defend the historicity of all these stories. But that was not the original view. Christians often turn to 1 Corinthians 15 as a statement that the tropes surrounding Jesus's death, resurrection and ascension are in fact history. And that the Apostle Paul is saying, whatever's gone before in terms of stories of death and resurrection, the stories around Jesus are fact, they are history. And that is the way 1 Corinthians 15 is read. And yet, he appears to be quoting from a Buddhist source. It contains tropes from the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra. When it says Jesus appeared first to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then to the 500 witnesses, many of whom have died, though some still remain. How is it that he appears to be quoting a Buddhist source? Now, the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, as we have it, is a common era document. It dates, the consensus would say, from the 100s of the common era. So that's about 50 years after the Apostle Paul was writing. So he can't be quoting from the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra as we have it today. So what's going on there? Well, I would first of all point out that a narrative tradition is very often oral tradition before it is written tradition. And so the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra may have had prototype versions that we don't know about, but it would certainly have been an oral tradition before it became a document. Is Paul quoting the oral tradition? Is it the other way around? Logically, we have to say, could it be the writer of the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra is quoting the Apostle Paul, since Paul was writing 50 years prior? I would suggest that both documents are quoting a source, an Eastern source, that contained these tropes. They are both writing about the ascension of the master, the master transcending death, the Mahapari Nirvana Sutra and Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and they are using tropes that make that point. 
And Paul is saying that we are on a longer journey, that life doesn't end with death, that this is the story of Jesus, and if we can't accept it in the story of Jesus, then how can we accept it for ourselves? And both writers have reached for the same tropes of the ascended master appearing first to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then to 500 witnesses, many of whom have died, some of whom remain. It is a reminder that to make these kind of theological claims, a theological vocabulary is reached for. Tropes are found and then employed. Now, when the Apostle Paul says, if it's not true, then those of us who are being martyred are wasting our time, is he really talking about making the Christian tropes history? I think an indication would be to go to what the early Christians believed. So you go to Justin Martyr, one of the first martyrs of the patristic period. What did he go to the stake over? When he argued that Jesus should be taken seriously, he didn't say, look, your tropes are all fiction. Ours is history. You go to his writings and he is saying, what we Christians are saying about Jesus you Romans and Greeks have been saying about figures since time immemorial. You're happy to talk about death and resurrection and ascension. That's all we're saying about our Jesus. You should allow those who venerate Jesus as divine to make the same claims. And in fact, he likens the story of Jesus with the story of Dionysus, the son of Zeus, killed and resurrected. I mean, if I were to say to you that... I can tell you of a man who was torn to pieces, died, rose again, and ascended to heaven. You might say, well, that's obvious. You're talking about Jesus. No, that's Justin Martyr writing about Dionysus, the son of Zeus. If I were to tell you of a man who was born of a virgin, had 12 disciples, walked on water, preached the Sermon on the Mount, performed miracles, was executed between two thieves, rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, you would probably say, well, yes, of course, that's Jesus. No, that's the Egyptian god Horus. All these tropes have been used before. And that's why Justin Martyr was saying, there is nothing new in the Christian story. Allow those who are devoted to Jesus as divine to hold the same beliefs about Jesus. And that was what Justin Martyr went to the stake over. Not over claiming that the tropes of the pagans were rubbish and the tropes about Jesus were actual history. He wanted Christians to be able to venerate Jesus as divine in the same way that the pagans had venerated their figures in Egyptian, Greek and Roman literature. How do the ancient claims concerning the presence of Jesus in India relate to this panoply of ancient stories and tropes? Is it possible that the historical Jesus made the journey to India and yet made no impact in terms of the creation of a primitive Christianity? How could it be that Christianity would grow up in Rome surrounding his three years public ministry in Judea and nothing emerged in India until ages later. I think it's easy to forget that Christianity is what grew up in the absence of Jesus. Christianity as a religion, as a set of documents and practices grew up after the time of Jesus in Judea. That was not his work. It was the work of others. And so there's really no logic to expecting Jesus to replicate in India what others had done after his time in the Jerusalem to Rome tradition. That was the work of others. That was the story that emerged to tell the story of Jesus in that place. But if you go back to the earliest sources, which I would argue are the Gospels of Thomas and the documentary source Q, then you have a teacher, someone who toured with teaching and healing. And those are the claims made in India, that the Jesus who was seen there toured with teaching and healing. The claim at Rosa Ball in Srinagar is that Jesus was a teacher and a healer 
and a leader of the community of the healed. But there is no reference to a movement or an institution in his name. To my mind, that is true to the primitive tradition of Jesus. In the beginning, Jesus' story was told in a myriad of ways. Gnostic, pre-canonical and canonical texts all attest to the kaleidoscope of early views surrounding Jesus. Even within the canonical Gospels themselves, you have a reference to layers of story surrounding Jesus. So you go to Thomas and Q, and you don't have the resurrection and ascension narrative. You have his teachings. Go to the Gnostic texts, and there are stories about Jesus surviving the cross and then traveling. And it's in those stories that the French, Japanese, Indian, Chinese claims have a historical footing. And I would argue that the canonical texts give witness to that story, as well as the mainstream orthodoxy of died, was buried, and supernaturally resurrected. That seems to be the surface story of the canonical gospels, and yet you've got these clues that there's another story buried there. When Jesus says that his life will follow the pattern of the story of Jonah, he's offering the sign of Jonah, which something that should kill someone doesn't kill someone. And then you've got the mystery of a bleeding body being taken down from the cross, which suggests that the body is still alive. And then you've got the words themselves, which mean arose and was again. They don't imply a supernatural resurrection in the way that orthodoxy teaches. So I believe that within the canonical gospels, you've got layers of information, you've got tropes, because the writers of the gospels knew world literature, they knew world religion, world philosophy, and for that reason, it is vital for us to read the gospels in the context of that wider family of literature. So they're using tropes from antiquity. They are also layering stories. So you remember I said that Paul might be quoting earlier tropes and that written traditions follow oral traditions. We go to Luke's gospel. Luke says that openly at the beginning, that he is writing down things that are oral tradition from eyewitnesses. And so you've got that layer of information as well. And then you've got these couple of story layers, the, the orthodox view and then the Gnostic view of Jesus surviving the cross and living for longer. How do we weigh those narrative traditions? Do we say, well, because Emperor Theodosius decided this was the orthodoxy and illegalized everything else, I'm gonna stick with that, that what he called heresy, I'll call heresy? But how damaging to faith in Jesus is the earlier ereticized view that Jesus survived the cross? How damaging to orthodoxy is it to read the Gospels in the light of the world mythology of the day? If the canonical accounts are not read as history, then what is the merit of them? I've been a follower of Jesus' teachings for more than 40 years. I find his teaching coherent and empowering when read according to the root meanings of the key words, not through the lens of later orthodoxy. I don't read it through the lens of heaven and hell, which is the church doctrine. I don't read it through the lens of worship and obedience, which is a church framework. Go to the root meanings and there's an empowering invitation for human beings to discover what is possible and to explore the human condition. If you go to the root meanings of the key words of the sermon that Jesus toured with for the first year, according to Matthew's gospel, he says, go beyond the mind because the powers and principles of the cosmos are available to you. Elsewhere, he says, the whole cosmic realm is inside you. And I can't think of a more profound invitation to explore than that. And 
the coherence of his teaching and the inspirational nature of those invitations and then the powerful way in which he modeled what that might look like, for me, I don't find that at all threatened by the possibility that Jesus lived a longer life and lived some of it in India. I don't find it at all difficult to believe that Jesus was a teacher and a leader of the healed in the Levant and later in India. But it is only if you want to stick to this tight orthodoxy concerning the nature of the resurrection. It's only if you want to read the Gospels in a fundamentalist way that you will feel threatened by these international claims. But when it is all narrative tradition, on what basis can you say, I believe that narrative tradition, one which has no physical evidence to it at all, and I disregard all these other narratives which together corroborate each other in saying, that Jesus lived a longer life. If you go to Irenaeus, now he was a foundational church father. He didn't believe Jesus died at 33. He believed that Jesus was at least 50 years old. Doesn't seem to threaten his confidence in Jesus. And he points to evidences again within the canonical gospels themselves that this is the case. There's a moment in which Jesus is teaching in the gospel of John, and the crowd say to him, wait a minute, you're not yet 50. And Irenaeus says, this implies he was in his 40s when he gave this message. You don't say that to someone who's only 30 years old. And I think we forget that the tradition that says that Jesus was 33 when he died is only one tradition within the canonical tradition. And that the canonical tradition is only part of the spectrum of beliefs and doctrines and documents that formed Christianity in the beginning. And the early church fathers did not believe what we now consider mainstream Christian orthodoxy. Their view was far more open to the possibility that Jesus could have lived a longer life and may even have survived the cross rather than been supernaturally resurrected, survived to live a longer life elsewhere, such as in India. And if that is within the scope of primitive Christianity, on what basis do we turn around to the Indian claim and say, that has to be rubbish? One day, I would love us to be able to get hold of that document from Hemis Monastery and date the document. If we can date it to close to the time of Jesus, then you've got circumstantial evidence for taking that narrative tradition more seriously. And as I said before, I think one of the liberating things about seeing Jesus on this bigger canvas is that you begin to appreciate him within the world of international thought. And when you can set him free from these constricting and manipulative doctrines of heaven and hell, worship, obedience, sin, punishment, you realize it's a better Jesus than you thought he was, and that he actually did come to inspire and empower us for a better human experience. And so I think I enjoy talking about Jesus in India as a possibility because it begins to break open these boxes and allow us to look at Jesus in a different context than we have before. I think it's a great shame that Jesus is associated with imperialism, with colonialism, with misogyny, with the enslavement of entire people groups, when this bears no relation to his teaching at all. I think it's a shame that Jesus has been used to endorse all kinds of feudalism. I mean, up the road from where I used to live, you could go and see a church with beautiful art, uh, that had been painted on the interior of the church's walls, and which when Cromwell became the Lord Protector during Britain's revolution and its period as a republic, his forces had gone around whitewashing over this ancient art. Except, just up the road from where I used to live in Hampshire, the old art shows through. And you can see one of the reasons Cromwell wanted to do that, because there you've got Jesus. There you've got the apostles, there you've got the mother of Jesus, and there's the squire, and there's the bailiff. 
And once again, you can see how an institutional religion has hijacked Jesus in order to authenticate the local squire and the local bailiff to tell you to behave and remain an obedient, compliant citizen, meekly paying, paying, and obeying. So again, I would say that is a distortion of the real Jesus. By talking about Jesus in India, I hope it calls people's attention back to those early sources, outside of this resurrection and ascension storyline, outside of this religion of worship and obedience. The whole concept of Jesus in India is one that breaks these boundaries of thought control and orthodoxy, allows us to see him in a fresh light and approach teachings which for me have been transformational.